an operator of Jefferson Orleans, who also plays uh, big band sound in his 14-piece orchestra here on Sunday evenings. Hey, we're having a class basically about uh, jazz, the history of jazz, and it's taught by a good friend of yours, Dr. Mike Carugo. First question I'd really like to ask is, could you give us a definition of jazz? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> I can tell you what I like as far as jazz. Naturally, the jazz that's played, uh, that has been played with the big bands over the years, and also uh, Dixieland and New Orleans jazz. I think those are, in, in my mind, uh, and to my taste, I like those the best. Uh, I never did go for the uh, sort of way out uh, bebop uh, very much. I know it's good, it's, uh, it's all good, but uh, personal taste, I, I stick to uh, big band jazz. When you say Dixieland, is there any one artist that might stick out to being really talented from the New Orleans area that you've played with? One that sticks out the most in your mind. I know you're good friends with Pete Fountain, so. <laughs> I'd have to say Pete from the world. <laughs> of course, Al. You know, there's, there's so many other greats, Murphy Campo, and I, and I know I'm going to step on a lot of toes uh, but by uh, forgetting some of the names. He caught me off guard there. I'd like to have had them written down because there's, <laughs> there's a ton of great uh, Dixieland jazz musicians uh, in this town. Let me ask you, why don't you tell, do us a favor and tell us a little bit how you got started in music and how long you've been playing music and how you progressed to where you're at. It started when my mother bought me a saxophone when I was at P.A. Capdo Grammar School uh, back in, see, I graduated from, from Capdo in 38 and played in that little band and then uh, went to Holy Cross and played in a Holy Cross High School band and it was there that I actually formed a dance band uh, and it was a big band, five saxes, five brass and three rhythm and we started uh, playing around town at different places. Uh, played professionally actually uh, in 1940 when I was 14 years old. And it was my band, uh, it was about about 10 pieces at that time. What was the name of it then? It was Pat Barbara. Really? Yeah. And it's contained all this time? We had a boy in a band that uh, his daddy originated the Martin Poor Boy. Oh, okay. Lenny uh, Martin Jr. Uh, played alto sax, also went to Holy Cross. The band was basically a lot of Holy Cross musicians. And uh, we, we started playing then and played up until uh, uh, 1944 when I went into the service and uh, stayed, uh, you know, in the service until 46, came back and reformed the group. Were any of the original players still? Oh, yes. Yes, the same, uh, a lot of the same guys came back that uh, went in the, in the band because they went off into the service. Some of them left earlier than I did because they were old enough. Honey, I'm still playing with you now? No. No, not uh, not at the present time. Not any of the boys that were in the band uh, right after the war. We have some that, that uh, uh, came in the band about uh, 30, 35 years ago. Uh, but, you know, shortly after that. Yeah. Uh, then where'd you, where'd you play out from there? Where, where did the band progress to? Well, we, we played at uh, different places. The ballrooms were still going, uh, like nightclubs were, were going pretty strong in, in the New Orleans area when they had gambling. We played in Jefferson Parish where they, the gambling was legal, played at a club called Al's Club. That was in the, uh, December of 1947 and we stayed there for about three months and we moved up to a, a, a real big uh, ballroom called, uh, and a nightclub called uh, the Plaza Club. Uh, they had uh, slot machines there and they had a, a, a uh, a blackjack table, and they, they could afford to pay big bands. So we had a big band there at the Plaza Club. Then, uh, then gambling uh, was declared illegal, and that hurt a lot of musicians. Uh, the club owners couldn't pay uh, the salary, so we had to cut the size of the band down. We moved uh, to a, a well-known spot called Lentfins. Yeah. And uh, but we had uh, we cut the band down to five saxes, uh, one trumpet, and three rhythm. But we we kept our basic sound, which was sort of patterned after Glenn Miller, who was one of my idols. And we, we kept that, uh, that sound going, and we moved, uh, if you want me to go straight th through with it, uh, to a place called uh, the, Trock uh, the Melody Lane. It, was, it had a couple of names. When we played there, it was a Melody Lane. That was a pl uptown called Lilla ran that place. And the same size band, five saxes, one trumpet, three rhythm. 
Uh, then we opened a place called the Gator Lagoon in the Swamp Room on Canal Street. And that uh, was about the end of our nightclub uh, run. And that had to be about 1953. From that point on until 1972, we, we did, uh, as all musicians call, spot work. Mm -hmm. Different private parties and different hotels for uh, conventions and uh, uh, script dances, uh, as they call them. They charged an admission to get in and uh, dance to uh, ballroom type music. Mm -hmm. Well, that basically gave you an idea for your Sunday night dances. Here at the Jefferson Orleans. Well, uh, throughout that long period of time, when we were playing all this spot work, and there were no, there were no nightclubs at all left. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the question would always come up: uh, Where can we go to dance? I heard that throughout my lifetime, just about. So my wheels were always turning in my head, uh, thinking about uh, the possibility of having a place to put the big band and uh, let people come and, and dance to the big band. Uh, now, very few people would do something like that and take a risk like that unless they uh, had a band and, and really wanted to do something yeah. like this. Yeah, really? It was, a, it was a, a big risk. Yeah. We didn't know whether it would work. So we figured we'd, we'd have a, a combination ballroom where people could come to dance and also uh, a multi-use facility where it could be rented out for wedding receptions and such. And fortunately, it worked. It, it worked so, pretty good for the last 16 years. 1972 until now, right. Why don't you do us a favor and tell us about uh, what instruments you play and with them, you mainly play the saxophone. That's right? all, really. My interest throughout my life, uh, if I can back up a little bit, when I got out of the Navy, I went to a, a school called the Grunewald School of Music and studied arranging. And I was so interested in arranging, I, I, t I put all of my interest into that. I didn't uh, worry about improvisation on my on my instrument. Uh, I figured there were a lot of great musicians around that would be playing in my band. I could do all the solo work and and uh, play all the jazz uh, and do all the improvising. So I didn't study that. I didn't try to work on my horns. I'm, I'm a section man. Uh, mm -hmm. but you take the music away from me, and it's like my eyes. I, I I'm, I'm lost. Well, that was kind of. Uh one of the unique parts of the big bands was that there wasn't that much improvisation. It's more or less from music well, sheet music. They, they had, uh, on, on the uh, the jump tune, so to speak, you'd, you'd have uh, uh, usually a, a tenor solo uh, where you could improvise. You had the freedom of playing uh, you know, anything you wanted, just about. Uh, and usually a trombone and, and, and a trumpet. And, and a lot of the, the big uh, band arrangements uh, Offhand, uh, Woodchopper's Ball, uh, uh, in, in the Mood, any of these uh, type things, they always had uh, some uh, artist well, it was, that it, could display his uh, talent. At least it was, a, as far as the improvisation was, it was a more defined because of the big bands and so many pieces involved in the bands, what do you think? Well, yeah, you had, you had you know, so many, uh, usually a few measures to do it, and they might limit you to maybe uh, 16 bars instead of letting a, uh, a jazz musician play 32 or uh, maybe 64, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, in your, have you been playing music for, since you were, what, 14 years old? You had your own band, you've been playing music a lot of years. What about, uh, over the years, have you been fortunate enough to play with some big, Entertainers, oh, I know Pete. You play with. Well, we've shared the bandstand with Pete. We've shared. We've shared the. When I say shared the bandstand, we would play. Pete Fountain would play, and then we'd come back and play. And uh, similar things happen, like when we we play for Bacchus, we shared the bandstand uh, where we would alternate with the uh, great Harry James, one of the greatest trumpet players that's ever lived, in, in my estimation. Uh, we shared it with Freddie Martin one year. We. We shared it with the great Duke Ellington. I must have been a treat. Oh, it was great. Well, the beauty part about it was we were not playing when they were playing, naturally, so we could get <laughs> off the bandstand and walk over to <clears throat> a few feet away on their bandstand. You'd be a spectator. And, uh, yeah, and, and uh, catch all of this real. And now uh, there's some great jazz musicians in, uh, say, Duke Ellington band, yeah. you know, and Count Basie. Uh, uh, he he played for Bacchus. We, we didn't have... Uh, <laughs> that opportunity. That was very early. Uh, but we had the, the pleasure of backing a few people throughout my lifetime that I, it was quite a thrill. Uh, the most recent uh, was Bing Crosby. Really? 
And Where was it that? was right here at the uh, Hyatt, at the Hyatt Regency, and it was the second to last performance that he made before he passed away. And we had the the real honor of. of uh, that must have been a real treat. It was not in my band. We had to augment the band uh, and get some musicians from uh, the symphony and. Uh, uh, Peter Dumborian took care of that, and uh, did that. You know that part of it because uh, he knows all of those gentlemen, the violin players and so forth. That uh, we had to add to our group. When when you're talking about, uh, you said mentioned Count Basie and Duke Ellington. In your estimation, who, uh, what band do you think was the best, or uh, the best band leader of the big band sound? Is there anybody that? Maybe it might be easy just to ask your personal favorite. Well, I leaned because everybody likes to, to, to go way back. And my favorite way back, when you know, if you want to reminisce, was Glenn Miller. Uh, well, obviously, you opened the nightclub. Yeah, we, we yes. Yeah, String of Pearls. Well, well no, his, was his theme song, which is uh, Moonlight Serenade, and we end with that. We don't claim it as our theme song. I always say that this is a theme song of the late Glenn Miller. And we do a lot of Glenn Miller arrangements, but of course we do a lot of the other big band arrangements. Uh, I lean heavy to uh, Glenn Miller as the, the finest big band, but that's my personal taste. And there's so many others, uh, uh, Harry James, the Darcy Brothers, uh, goodness, the Basie, Ellington, all of these bands, and I know, I'm, again, I'm leaving some out. <laughs> what <laughs> about Woody Herman, that's another great jazz great, Woody well, Herman. Now your, your band's down to 14 pieces right now, and it sounds good. Who are your? Well, it's up your to 14 pieces. Up to <laughs> during that, that time, until we built this place, uh, nobody would pay for a band that big. Uh, Who is your? Or is your band patterned after one of the big bands as far as the, the makeup with your instruments? And could you tell us about your? Uh, well, you know what instruments you have and. A little bit about the makeup. Basically, all big bands had at least three rhythms, piano, bass, and drums. Uh, usually five saxophones, a baritone, two tenors, and two altos. And most of the time, these uh, musicians double on clarinet and some on flute. That's in the reed section. Uh, now, in the trombones, I like three trombones or even four, but I mean, that's sort of out of the question because there you go with expense again, it's, it's, it's costly. The more musicians you have, the more it costs for the band. But a good balanced brass section is three trombones, which we use a lot of times, and uh, definitely two trombones, and three trumpets. Now most of the big bands, when they were very popular, they'd use the same thing. Uh, well, they'd go four rhythm, they'd add a guitar in the rhythm section, They'd keep the same five saxes, usually no more than five saxes. But then some of them would go to four trumpets and four trombones, which is great if you can afford it. And then, of course, you have the vocalist also to pay. Well, Pat, I tell you, uh, over the years, I'm, I'm sure you just told us a few of those great experiences, but... Oh, another one, if I may mention, uh, he died recently, is Liberace, yeah. great musician. We had the pleasure of backing him, plus, I mean, not just my group, but plus, harp, violins, and everything, but it was quite an experience, and it was uh, billed as the Pat, uh, you know, Liberace, uh, backed by uh, Pat Barbaro and his orchestra, and which was, you know, real, really that, nice to be associated yeah. with artists like that. That had to be. Uh, I'm, go ahead, I'm going to mention something. That, I want, what I want to ask is, and let my classmates know, Pat, that... Uh, our good teacher, Dr. Karuba, is a good friend of yours and also played in your band, and I figured this would be an opportunity where you could all get a little laugh and you could maybe pick on him a little bit. Tell us, why don't you well, tell you us know, a little story? I was thinking about something uh, when I mentioned Liberace, and it, really, I did not know that this, you were going to ask me this question next, but uh, coincidentally, Mike Karuba played oboe in the reed section with us, and he can attest to this, when we backed Liberace. In the auditorium, he was sitting right next to me, because I sat, because uh, Liberace's brother, George, conducted the orchestra, and we were in the pit. Mm -hmm. But Mike sat right next to me, and he doubled oboe on that particular uh, engagement. <coughs> now, Mike 
I didn't even know Mike played oboe at the time. I found out when I when I was calling around, someone said, Mike Ruba plays oboe. I said, he does? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mike brought his oboe along and played the oboe parts plus the uh, whatever the other. Uh, I was on one of the tenors. Uh, he was probably on the second tenor. I was on the fourth chair. But uh, uh, talking about Mike, now when you talk about jazz, Mike has got to be and is is, is respected by a lot of musicians in, in this entire area because he is one of the finest jazz musicians uh, that I know and also uh, a great lead man on alto, sax, on clarinet, whether it be Glenn Miller, because when you play Glenn Miller's uh, uh, stuff, if I may call it stuff, arrangements, you have clarinet lead. Very important that the vibrato be there, that it be a good, bright sound. You can't have a, a weak clarinet player if they have a good, strong clarinet player and a tenor doubles that, which I've always done. I've always doubled the lead with the clarinet. <coughs> it's very important that the tenor and the clarinet have the same vibrato, and of course everybody else in between, the three harmonies in between, because you have the melody, melody, and three harmonies in between, which forms a Glenn Miller sound in, in the sax section. Uh, but whether, whether Mike plays with my band on lead, on tenor, or, or maybe even on oboe, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we he, had the, he's great. He does a great, great We job. had the pleasure of watching him perform with a couple of different groups uh, at the jazz and uh, the, the festival, the French Quarter Festival. <laughs>
Bill. Hey, <laughs> give me two. <laughs> you don't know think? I think Jimmy's.